Welcome to Cinematic Excrement and my ongoing quest to review every movie that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to get through this thing called Under the Cherry Moon. And I realized that was predictable as hell, but what else was I going to do? I mean, it's Prince for crying out loud. I cannot start a review of a Prince movie without referencing the intro for Let's Go Crazy. I just can't. I am legally obligated, probably. Under the Cherry Moon is a film by Prince Rogers Nelson, better known simply as Prince, or for a brief period during his musical career, whatever that is. And what can I say about Prince that hasn't already been said? The man was a musical god taken from us far too soon. And I do not use the term musical god lightly. I say it because it's true. He was an incredibly prolific artist who released almost 40 studio albums over about as many years, and he wrote songs for a multitude of other artists, including the Bangles, Cyndi Lauper, Madonna, and Alicia Keys. He was also incredibly controversial. You know that parental advisory label? Prince is the reason why that exists. I'm not kidding, look it up. And above all else, he was an amazingly talented musician. His debut album, For You, featured 27 different instruments, and he played all of them. All. Of. Them. Granted, most of them were some variation on keyboard or percussion, but still, 27 instruments is nothing to sneeze at. Now, I consider myself to be fairly musically inclined. I've played piano since the age of 5, clarinet since the age of 10, and over the years I've dabbled in viola, tenor saxophone, xylophone, marimba, and a few other percussion instruments, and synthesizer if you want to count that as a separate instrument. I even sang in a choir once upon a time. Then puberty hit and it was all downhill from there. But the point is, I am very musically talented and have been labeled as such by many, many people over the course of my life. I do not tell you this to brag. I am not trying to toot my own horn or anything of the sort. No, 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 no. I tell you this because when I say that next to Prince, I look like a small child learning how to play chopsticks, I want you to understand where I'm coming from. I could never hope to be as talented as that man was, and you mark my words, a hundred years from now, they will be talking about the music of Prince the way we talk about Mozart or Beethoven today. Where am I going with this, you might well ask? Well, I am about to shit all over a movie that Prince made. There's no getting around that. I am about to bash this movie because it's terrible. And I want to be clear that I am not doing this from a place of hate or spite. Far from it. I have nothing but respect for his accomplishments, his musical talents, and, if Charlie Murphy is to be believed, his mad baller skills. I am doing this with the recognition that even the mightiest among us stumble and fall now and then. And the phrase, stumble and fall, is probably the best way to describe Under the Cherry Moon. But before we get to that, let's back up a bit. Prince's first foray into the world of cinema came in 1984 with Purple Rain, directed by Albert Magnoli and starring the actual members of the time, Apollonia 6, and Prince's band The Revolution. The film was loosely based on Prince's own life. He plays a singer referred to only as The Kid, an up-and-coming musician playing club shows with his band and trying to catch that big break. Along the way, he has to deal with competition from other musical acts, creative differences with his bandmates, a burgeoning romance with another singer, and an abusive father at home. And I thought the movie was... okay. I didn't love it, I didn't hate it. It's fine. To be honest, I wasn't all that impressed with Prince's acting. The guy has charisma and stage presence to spare, but it seems like he has a lot of trouble getting out of stage performance mode. Almost everything he does looks like a pose, even when he's supposed to be angry. Take this scene where he's trying to confront his father after he just beat up his mother for the umpteenth time. After me, motherfucker! It's that little twirl at the end that really sells the rage, don't you think? In fact, most of the acting in the movie wasn't all that great, which I suppose is to be expected. The cast was primarily made up of musicians, not actors, and it shows. And the story seems like it's trying to do too many things at once and feels a bit unfocused. But there are some bright spots. Clarence Williams III had some good scenes as the kid's father, and Morris Day did a pretty good job convincing me he was a raging, egomaniacal dickhead. And it has a few legitimately funny moments, like this scene between Day and Jerome Benton. Okay, what's the password? You got it. Got what? The password. Password is what? Exactly. The password is exactly? No, exactly's on third base. But seriously, the movie is worth watching for that scene alone. Their timing is perfect. 
But the best part of the movie is, naturally, the music. The Purple Rain album served as a soundtrack and has some classic Prince songs, including Let's Go Crazy, When Doves Cry, I Would Die For You, and of course, the title track. It's some of Prince's best work, and it earned him a freaking Oscar. I just wish the rest of the film was as good as the soundtrack. In some ways, Purple Rain kinda reminds me of Bohemian Rhapsody. The soundtrack was awesome, the movie, not so much. Also, like Bohemian Rhapsody, the last 15 minutes is basically just a concert. One hell of a concert to be sure, but if I want to watch a concert video, I'll do just that. I'm supposed to be watching a movie here. For the life of me, I will never understand how that movie got a Best Picture nomination. And how did it win Best Editing? The editing in that movie was objectively terrible. Unless that was somehow a way of compensating John Ottman for having to basically finish the movie on his own, since Brian Singer had fucked off at that point. Hold it, hold it, hold it. One at a time, Sean. One at a time. Focus. Sorry, where were we? Oh, right, Purple Rain. It isn't really my cup of tea, but I certainly don't hate it. It's hard to hate a movie with that soundtrack. Like I said, it's fine. And if you're a fan of that flick, that's fine. More power to you. But whether you personally enjoyed it or not, it was a huge hit, pulling in about 10 times its $7 million budget. And if that wasn't enough, the album was certified diamond by the RIAA and earned Prince and the Revolution a Grammy. So with all that success, naturally it was only a matter of time before Prince made another film. And that film was Under the Cherry Moon. To say it was not as well received as Purple Rain would be an understatement. Under the Cherry Moon hit theaters on July 4th, 1986, and could only manage number 11 at the box office during its opening weekend. In fairness, this was not a good weekend for new movies. Five of them debuted that weekend, the other four being Big Trouble in Little China, About Last Night, The Great Mouse Detective, and the top grossing new movie of that weekend, Psycho 3, which debuted at number 8. The top grossing movie that weekend, if you're curious, was The Karate Kid Part 2 for the third straight week. The same would be true the following week. And a popular movie being number one at the box office for a month straight was actually fairly common back then. Not that it doesn't happen today. Black Panther last year was on top for five straight weekends, but that's the exception nowadays. Likely because Hollywood puts out many more movies than they used to, and society has a much shorter attention span. We consume the latest product and move the hell on. But back in the 80s and even into the 90s, it was not at all uncommon for a movie to be on top for four weeks, five weeks, six weeks, and beyond. Hell, for pretty much the entire winter season from late 90 to early 91, the number one movie at the box office was Home Alone. That kid in his booby-trapped house dominated cinemas for 12 straight weeks. 12. Nothing since then has even come close. I know, I checked. I do the pointless, mind-numbing research so you don't have to. Speaking of pointless and mind-numbing, let's get back to Under the Cherry Moon. The first thing you'll notice is the movie is in black and white. I have no idea why. It was actually filmed in color after the studio objected to making a black and white movie, but ultimately Prince got his way and it was converted to black and white in post. I guess they were going for a Casablanca type of vibe, and in the opening scene, they largely succeed. But that's really the only scene where it succeeds. For the rest of the movie, the old-timey black and white look does not fit at all, especially with the very modern soundtrack from Prince and the Revolution. It's rather jarring. Now, of course, it is possible to do black and white in the modern era and do it well. Schindler's List certainly comes to mind. Or more recently, Roma. But with Under the Cherry Moon, it feels like they had some grand artistic purpose for doing black and white, but never really defined what that purpose was. The movie opens with a voiceover introducing us to Christopher Tracy, played by Prince. Mr. Tracy, along with his cousin Tricky, played by Prince's Purple Rain co-star Jerome Benton, are American gigolos living in France who spend their time trying to con wealthy French women out of their money. Ain't that the American dream? The women he knew came in all sizes, shapes, and colors, and they were all rich. So he's still kind of a pig. Christopher lived for all women. But he died for one. Well, thanks for the spoilers. 
During the opening scene, we see Tracy playing the piano and making eyes at one of the aforementioned wealthy French women while Tricky feeds him notes on napkins, a bit that starts out kind of funny but goes on way too long. And throughout this scene, the camera focuses almost exclusively on Prince and the woman he's trying to woo. There's clearly some other stuff going on in this club. We can hear an orchestra accompanying Tracy, and there appears to be a dancer in the background. So why are we focusing so much on... Oh, I should have guessed. Prince didn't just star in this movie, he also directed it. And boy is this a vanity project if ever I saw one. But it wasn't supposed to be this way. The original director was Mary Lambert, who at the time was mainly known for directing music videos. She would later go on to direct the original version of Stephen King's Pet Cemetery, as well as The Asylum's Mega Python vs. Gatoroid. Suffice to say, her career has had some ups and downs. Under the Cherry Moon was to be her big screen debut. Unfortunately, she and Prince clashed over creative differences almost immediately, and she was demoted to an advisory role just four days into shooting. I presume she wanted to make a good movie, but Prince had other ideas. Ultimately, he fired her and took over directing duties himself. Normally, Directors Guild of America rules would not allow such a thing, but since they weren't filming in America, once again, Prince got his way. I get the impression that that was kind of how Prince's entire career went. No one ever wanted to tell him no. Now, normally this wasn't really a problem, since musically at least, he actually knew what he was doing. But making an album and making a movie are two very different things. And if there was ever a time when Prince needed someone to tell him no, repeatedly, this was it. Anyway, the story is Christopher and Tricky have their sights set on a beautiful young woman named Mary Sharon, played by Kristen Scott Thomas in her feature film debut. Mary just turned 21 and is about to receive a massive trust fund from her obscenely rich parents. So they crash her birthday party with the hopes of getting into her pants and her wallet. But getting into her pants might be difficult since, well... How do you like my birthday suit? I, 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 I what? I designed it myself. You mean you've had plastic surgery? And then, draped only in what appears to be a bedsheet, she starts playing the drums while the crowd chants, Planet Rock, You Just Can't Stop. I wish they would stop, because I have no idea what the fuck is going on. This is our introduction to the character, and it's completely batshit. She never acts like this for the rest of the movie, so I don't even know what the point was. Anyway, Chris eventually meets Mary face to face, and my god, even in black and white, that outfit is loud. And prepare yourself for a shock. Mary does not immediately take a liking to him. Oh, really? You mean she doesn't fall head over heels in love with the arrogant, self-serving con artist who's constantly behind on his rent because he's too lazy to get a real job? <laughs> the devil, you say? But lest you think I'm on Team Mary, she's not much better. She's every bit as arrogant and self-centered as Christopher. The only difference is she's spoiled and rich. It appears we're meant to feel sympathy for her as her father is withholding her trust fund unless she marries some other rich douchebag so their families can combine their respective fortunes. Oh no. You mean if you don't follow your father's wishes, you won't just get handed a pile of money that you never had to work a day in your life to earn? That's my tiny violin! Over the course of the movie, these two eventually fall in love with each other, and I'll be damned if I can explain why. They have absolutely no reason to like each other, mainly because they have no likable qualities. There's no chemistry between them at all, and yet the movie expects me to buy this romance. Boy howdy is that asking a lot. And of course, Mary's father does not approve of their relationship, and don't get me wrong, he is an asshole. He's horribly controlling of his daughter, who is a grown-ass woman by this point. He shows concern for nothing but his wealth. He wears a jacket with a dollar sign on it, for Christ's sake. This man is a cartoon villain. And for bonus sleazeball points, he cheats on his wife. So you would think I'd want to cheer Mary and Christopher on, out of spite if nothing else, but honestly, I'm hoping they all die. I know at least one of them will, but we'll get there. So we watch their relationship blossom, and Chris ultimately comes to the conclusion that perhaps he should give up the con artist's life. He truly has fallen in love, and that's all he needs. And this dialogue... Ugh. Two people really dug one another? They couldn't be torn apart no matter what happened. My god, was the screenwriter in high school when she wrote this? But honestly, the dialogue isn't the thing that bothers me the most. What bothers me the most is Prince's kissing. It's just... Awful. What is he even doing here? How does a man who just oozes sexuality kiss like that? 
And if his kissing wasn't bad enough, the sex scene with him and Mary is even worse. And may I remind you, Prince directed this movie himself. If I didn't know any better, based on that scene alone, I would swear Prince was a virgin were literally everything else about him not evidence to the contrary. That man got it and got it often. So what happened here? Well, at some point, Mary learns the truth about Christopher's motivations for seeking a relationship with her because Tricky just blabs about it out of jealousy. And when he's asked why, his explanation is... interesting. What'd you do that for? Because of the full moon, I'm a werewolf bitch. Oh, wow, that's amazing. You know what? If anyone ever asks you to explain your actions, and either you don't want to explain or just don't have an explanation, that should be your go-to answer. Why would you put pineapple on pizza? Because it's a full moon and I'm a werewolf, bitch! Try it. Let me know how it goes. But despite Tricky's interference, Christopher manages to win Mary back through more crappy dialogue. I have exactly four and a half minutes. I need a lifetime. I need a drink. Unfortunately, their relationship comes to a tragic end as Mary's father has one of his henchmen just straight up shoot Christopher in the back. Well, that was a surprise. I mean, I knew he was going to die. They told us he was going to die, but I didn't think he was just going to get straight up murdered. And of course, it wouldn't be a vanity project without an overdramatic death scene. And if Christopher wasn't a horrible person, I might have cared that he died. And if Mary wasn't a horrible person, I might have cared that she finally told her father to get stuffed. But by the time we got to this point, I was just glad the movie was over. And that's Under the Cherry Moon in a nutshell. It's not terribly interesting. Christopher and Mary are horrible people, and they are horrible for each other. And because everyone is horrible, there's really no one to root for. And the film just isn't very well made. As previously stated, the black and white format does not help this movie at all. And this lack of color is certainly not what you would expect from a colorful character like Prince. His acting has improved a bit since Purple Rain, but it still needs work. And his directing is just mind-boggling. The scene that really stands out to me is a phone call between Mary and Christopher. I can't show you the whole thing because it will almost certainly get flagged by Content ID. Instead, I shall perform this piss-poor reenactment. Oh, and unlike Prince in the original scene, I will wear a shirt. You're welcome. What it is. It's Mary. I was just wondering what you were doing. thinking. About what? Sex. I am not exaggerating these pauses. It really is that ridiculous. And you would think a movie starring Prince would have some good musical numbers, especially if you had seen Purple Rain. And you'd be wrong. While there are some Prince songs in the soundtrack, unless you count Mountains during the ending credits, the movie has exactly one musical number, Girls and Boys. And really, it's only about two-thirds of a musical number because the song gets interrupted by Mary's father. Why would you have a movie starring Prince and only have him perform two-thirds of a song? Why do you think people buy tickets to see a Prince movie? It ain't for his acting, I can tell you that. So did anything in this movie work? Well, there were some things that didn't not work. Jerome Benton actually does a pretty good job as Christopher's sidekick, Tricky. He has pretty good comedic timing and he and Prince played off each other well. I could believe these two were actually brothers or cousins or whatever the hell they were supposed to be. It's not very clear. Their relationship does have some bizarre aspects though, as evidenced in this scene where Chris is in the bath 
while wearing a hat, and Tricky is showering him with flower petals. I really don't know what's going on here, but this is a film by Prince. For all I know, wearing a hat in the bathtub and getting showered with flower petals was just a regular Tuesday night for him. And some of the comedic moments are actually kind of funny. There's a scene where Chris and Tricky are trying to claim they are not uneducated just because they came from Miami. Mary is incredulous. There's nothing in Miami but people who weren't born there and drugs. First of all, that was not a very good take. And second, how dare you? That is not fair to Miami, not at all. They have a thriving porn industry, I'll have you know. To show they are not uneducated, they teach Mary some words that they know and she doesn't. For example, recasto. And what does recasto mean, you might well ask? Well, if you wanted to buy a Sam Cooke album, where would you go? <laughs> you know, the first time I watched that scene, I thought it was the dumbest thing ever. But I'm not gonna lie, over time, it's grown on me. And the thought occurs that even if I explain to some of the young people out there that it's another way of saying record store, they probably still won't get it, because recostos are damn near extinct. But a handful of funny and entertainingly bizarre moments aside, the movie is pretty bad, and it flopped big time. Against a reported $12 million budget, it only made about $10 million at the box office, and it took home five Razzies. Of course, it tied with Howard the Duck for Worst Picture, Prince won Worst Actor, Worst Director, and Worst Original Song for Love or Money. Jerome Benton also won Worst Supporting Actor, which I do not agree with at all. How he beat Tim Robbins for Howard the Duck is beyond me. Kristen Scott Thomas was nominated for Worst Supporting Actress and Worst New Star, which I vehemently disagree with. She did as well as she possibly could have considering what she had to work with. And those nominations are not fair to her at all. And it earned one more nomination for Worst Screenplay, and yeah, that one's fair. I haven't been able to find very many comments from Prince himself regarding this movie, but I did find this. I don't regret anything about Under the Cherry Moon. I learned that I can't direct what I didn't write. Well, that claim would be put to the test in Prince's next movie, Graffiti Bridge, a kinda, sorta, but not really sequel to Purple Rain, which he did in fact write and direct. And it turns out Prince can't direct what he did write either. I did enjoy it more than Under the Cherry Moon, but that's a low bar to clear. Graffiti Bridge is not so much a movie as an extended string of music videos, and the plot is kind of a hot mess. Once again, Prince plays the kid who now owns his own club, and Morris Day is back as a rival club owner who is trying to buy every club, including the kids, in an area called Seven Corners. Which has four clubs. Makes sense if you don't think about it. And Ingrid Chavez shows up as some kind of guardian angel or something so she can help Prince get in touch with his spiritual side or some shit, and yeah, it gets pretty weird, even for Prince. What's really weird is while there is clearly some romantic tension in the air, Prince never actually kisses his leading lady this time. Presumably because Ingrid saw Under the Cherry Moon and said, no thank you. I can honestly say I was never bored with the film, but I was confused. Horribly, horribly confused. At least the music was good, though the lip-syncing often wasn't. But anyway, as previously mentioned, Under the Cherry Moon tied for Worst Picture of 1986 with Howard the Duck. So I guess the only question left to ask is, was the tie warranted? Well, I had to think about this one because Under the Cherry Moon and Howard the Duck are two very different movies, and as such, they are bad in different ways. Howard the Duck is a silly sci-fi movie that primarily failed by having terrible comedy and subpar special effects. Under the Cherry Moon is a romantic drama that primarily failed by giving me characters I couldn't give a shit about and just being boring overall. And upon reflection, I think that's what makes Under the Cherry Moon the worst film of the two, because the worst thing a movie can be is boring. Howard the Duck is stupid. I may have said this in my review once or twice, but it's certainly not boring. It's too ridiculous to be boring. Under the Cherry Moon, while it has its moments, has a tendency to drag two tons of ass. So with that in mind, I think a tie was the wrong call. Under the Cherry Moon should have been the sole winner. If you haven't seen it, it might be worth a watch if you're a big Prince fan, but in my opinion, you're better off sticking to Purple Rain. It's easily the best movie he ever made, and the other two aren't even close. Well, thank God we're finally done with 1986. Next time, we get to move on to 87.
and I have a feeling this is going to be painful. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it.